Hey there, I'm Soyce Make and welcome to the video where I show the C++ STL algorithms cheat sheet that I wrote on GitHub. So um, I have a bunch of C++ algorithm example code and definitions right here and you can see that for each C++ algorithm we have the name of the algorithm, we have a definition of what it actually does, we have a line that tells us what you need to pass into the function. We have another line that says what the function returns. And we have some really simple, you know, two or three lines of example code for each algorithm. And we have just this huge list of each of the algorithms. And this is just going to be a really nice cheat sheet so that you can always reference it if you need to find an algorithm or just look up quickly what something does, you know, without having to go through the whole life story of an algorithm and learn everything about it. You just want to see like a really simple mini sample of it and that's exactly what this cheat sheet is for. So in this video what we are going to do is I'm going to tell you what the C++ STL algorithms are and I'm going to tell you why they're useful. Then I'm going to go over some prerequisites that you need to know to use the C++ algorithms because you need to know what pairs are, you need to know what lambda expressions are, and you need to know what iterators are. And luckily, I wrote a blog post on my website, which is going to show you some simple example code. And we'll just go through it just so you know what these things are in case you never heard of them before. And even if you have heard of them, you should kind of listen to how I, I describe them because I'm going to put them in the context of actual C++ algorithms and not just, you know, how they are in general. It's going to be easier when I explain them. Let's just put it like that. So once we do that, once we go over that. I'm going to show you the base code and how you're going to actually make these actual examples. So for example, we have this example code right here and it looks nice to read, but how do you actually run this on your computer? Well, you know, we have this example main program where you just insert that code and I'm going to run one simple example so you can see how it actually compiles and stuff like that. It's good to see how other programmers actually, you know, run their code. And finally, I'm going to actually, after going through a few of them, I'm just going to um, have some end notes about some notes of this actual cheat sheet, how to best use it and what to watch out for. And that's going to be pretty much it. So all of these examples, this code right here that you can find on GitHub and on my website, there are going to be links to these pages below this video. If you go below this video, you will um, actually find the links here. You can come to this page, you can start, you can bookmark it, do whatever you need to do to remember it in the future. But don't do it yet. You can do that later. Also, subscribe to the channel while you're down there. But right now, just watch the rest of the video and watch me explain things. I'll remind you at the end. So, with all of the introductions out of the way, let's go ahead and get started learning about this stuff. So, what is the C++ STL algorithms? C++, like any other programming language, has a standard library, and ours is called the standard template library. And it provides a bunch of stuff that, you know, most programmers are probably going to use a bunch of times, and, you know, it's just convenient to have the library itself used, so, so um, provide for the programmers. So, for example, vectors is something that everybody uses, you know, because it's really popular and it's a really good data structure. So, they provide vectors as one of the standard library, you know, libraries. Um, and so there are some algorithms that you can use, which are just functions that work on commonly needed stuff for situations for commonly used containers like vectors and stacks. And that's all it is. Now, the reason you would use the STL algorithms, and they're not really even that like huge things. They're just like very simple things where you wouldn't even need to write your own for loops or, you know, your own functions or things like that. Um, but the reason you would use it is because they're usually efficient both memory-wise and space-wise. And you have to remember C++ is a language where memory constraints are a little bit tricky, you need to know what you're doing. So um, if you're going to use an STL container, you should probably try to use the STL algorithm. And even if it's not an STL container, they're just really good and they're really tiny ways. You, you know, look how, how tiny this code is that does a lot of work. That's a reason you would use it instead of writing your own code. And it's really expressive and easy for other people to understand your code too. So that's why you would use it. Now, we need to know how to actually use it by um, learning what Pairs, lambda expressions, and iterators are. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll go to this link on my website, which I have three tabs open. Let's close some. And okay, so C++ pair is just a mini container that groups two variables of any types together. If you have two variables and you want to, you know, put package them up, that's what a pair is. It's literally just a pair. And for example, we can make this a little bigger. You can see that one of the ways you write it is like this. Okay, so. The way you would read this is you have a pair, and in the pair, one of the items is going to be an integer. The other item is going to be a string. We're going to name the pair P because that's what the variable name is. And the way you make the pair is actually you call this make pair function. And the integer is going to be 5. 
and the string is going to be named source make. So that's it. We have our pair right there. How do you access the stuff inside of the pair? Well, you can do p.first. And this is calling p's first thing. The first thing is going to be an integer type. And of course, there's going to be the number 5. And p.second is going to be a string type. And it's going to have source make inside of it. So that's really simple. That's just, just a pair. Remember, you have two maybe even different items. They could be the same. It could be two ones. You just group them together into one container, one mini container. And you can access it with the first and second. And sometimes that gets returned because you need that in the C++ STL algorithms. But you keep that in mind for all your programming. So a lambda expression is literally just a different way of writing a function. You know what a function is, right? It's just this bundled up little piece of code that does a certain piece of functionality. Well, that's a lambda expression, except you write it a little bit differently. And for example, we have a lambda expression right here that checks if a number is Actually, it's greater than 2. I have to change this on the website. So, so let's see what it does. We have the Lambda expression. It's named source Lambda, and it's of type auto. We have to name it type auto for this reason, uh, for some reason. Don't worry about it. We have these brackets here, which aren't really that important. You can read about it later. But um, the function is going to have these parentheses that accept some sort of input parameters. And we're going to accept an int i in this case. And it's going to do something inside of the function, which is usual. And in this case, it's going to return a Boolean. So if i is greater than 2, it's going to return true. If i is not greater than 2, if it's equal to 2, 1, 0, something like that, then it's going to return false. And that's you know just a common function, but we have a name for it, and it's in this little line. And the reason you would use it is for something like this. So for example, this is going to be our first STL algorithm, so pay attention. In this short code example, we have a vector that holds integers named v, and we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 inside of the vector. Those are our elements. We have the same lambda expression that we had before, and typically you write the lambda expressions on one line. You don't usually do it like a function with multiple lines. You just put it on one line. And we're going to call the countif algorithm, which is going to count. Um, so let's see what it does. We have, it's going to look at v.begin to v.end, which in this case is going to be all of the elements in our vector v. And for each element, it's going to do this lambda thing on it. So the lambda is going to check if the element is greater than 2. And if it does, it's going to increment the counter, which is internally going to happen by 1. So for example, um, it's going to look at 1, and it's going to check, is 1 greater than 2? False, don't do anything. Is 2 greater than 2? False, don't do anything. Is 3 greater than 2? Well, yes, it is. So now it's going to increment its internal counter and say that we're holding 1 now. Is 4 greater than 2? Yes. Is 5 greater than 2? Yes. And it's going to return that number as an integer. So this evaluates to the number 3. And of course, we're just going to put that number 3 into this int count. And that's kind of how the STL algorithms work. And that's how a lambda expression works. It's just a function, but we write it in this way so that we can easily pass it to the STL algorithm. Just like that. It's really simple. Now, this v.begin and this v.end thing looks a little weird to me. So, so what is that? That's actually an iterator. Now, an iterator in C++ is just a variable that points to a certain element in a container. Now, you might ask, why do you need this? Why can't I just pass the index, you know, index 0 to index 4? Why can't I just do that? The reason is some containers don't have indexes, which seems simple, but you know you can do that with vectors. But if you use an element, uh, a container like a stack, there is no index in a stack. So the way you would do that is you would just have an iterator that points to some thing in a container. This is really good because you know for abstract data types where you don't have indexes, you don't know how you're accessing the elements. You you just you know have the iterator which points to um, an element in a container. So for example, for um, the same v that we had before, vector v. The way you would declare an iterator, which is v.begin like before, you just say, OK, uh, we have an iterator and is going to be for a vector int. It's going to be to an element in a vector int, and we name it it. So again, an iterator to a vector int element is going to be named it, and it points to v.begin. In this case, v.begin is going to be the number 1. And there's also v.end, which is really popular, which would be an imaginary number after this 5. So it would be at the end of the vector, like at a null element that doesn't exist. That's kind of how it works. 
But, you know, it, it seems a little scary, but let's do a couple more things. So um, you could do things like it plus plus, which in this case, let's say read.begin starts at one. It plus plus is going to increment the iterator to the next element. In this case, that's going to move to two because that's the next element sequentially. Or you could also do something like this. Um, iterator is going to equal source vector dot begin plus four. And, and what that would do is it would do something like, okay, v dot begin starts here, or in this case, source vector dot begin would start here at element one. And then we have to move by four. So plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. So this is going to be the element that it points to. And, and you can do simple math operations like that to access your elements in, in your container. And you know you can do some little cool indexing tricks. Like for example, if you want the index, you could just do one iterator minus another, and that just you know provides an integer for you. Now iterators might seem a little scary, but if you keep it you know just as we did, and remember that it's just a little bit of math, and it's just pointing to an element in a, con in a container, then that's it. It's really simple. It's not scary at all, because you're going to need to work with them a lot. But remember, it just points to some element in a container. Keep that in mind, and you're good to go. Now, those prerequisites are done. If you know about pairs, lambda expressions, and iterators, we can actually move on to learn about some of the STL algorithms. So this is the live demo part of the actual video, and I'm going to show you the code. So let's say we, we, let's say we see, I don't know, all of, and we want to see what happens if we actually run this code. Um, well, we have this thing called main.cpp, and I have a folder open on my computer. I'm going to open the terminal here, and I'm going to type bash to make this a Linux subsystem in Ubuntu terminal. And if you don't know what that is, I don't know what you're doing with your life, because even though uh, you know I'm on Windows right now, this is going to act as a Linux terminal. If you don't know what that is, Google it, because it's really kind of good if you're using Windows. I personally prefer it over Visual Studio Code and stuff like that for simple projects. But we need a file named main.cpp, so let's create that. And we need a make file. You know, my name is source make. I like make files. I don't like people doing the compiling for me with some magic IDE stuff. So uh, what is this? Main.cpp, we'll just use Notepad for now. So over here, we'll copy this in. And we have this make file right here. We'll open make file in Notepad2. We'll copy this in. So make file is just a simple thing. Main.cpp is just a simple thing. And for example, if you want to use this all of code and we want to run it to see if it actually works, if it actually compiles, if I'm not telling you, you know, false stuff, then we could just paste this in right here, format a little bit, and we could type make right here in our terminal and it's going to compile the program and it's going to run the program. Now there's no output, but let's see. Uh, let's just do std c out and all greater than one is the variable that comes here. And we'll do an std and l. And we'll go through this code really quickly too. So uh, we'll make it again and this time it should output one, which means true. So um, let's go through one example, right? Really quickly, let's see. Let's, let's do count. So count is going to count the number of items um, that count the number of times an item appears in the range. Okay, I can read. What do we need to give count? We need to give count an iterator to the beginning of a range and an iterator to the end of the range. Okay, makes sense. And the item that we want to count. And it returns an integer. Okay, that makes sense to me. So for example, let's say we have this vector right here, 5, 3, 7, 9, 3, 4. Then what we do is we say, okay, we call count. We're going to pass it an iterator to the beginning, an iterator to the end of our range, which in this case is going to be the whole vector. And we want to count the number of threes that show up. Um, I see one, I see two. Okay, that's two. So this is going to evaluate to two. We're going to store that in an integer named count of three, and that is going to be two. That's it. Really simple, and just like that, you can read through and see what all the STL algorithms are. Now let's just quickly go through the category types so you, that you kind of know what's going on. So you can figure something out about data. For example, you have some data in a container and you need to learn something about it. You can do these operations. Just scroll through slowly, count, mismatch, equals, search, lexicographical, compare. Now another category is you need to modify or copy a range. So for example, you have some range and you want to copy some stuff into another vector or something like that, then you can do that with these. Copy, move, swap, transform, replace, replace if, fill, generate, remove. There's so many of these. Unique, reverse. I had a lot. I spent a lot of time actually writing this out. Partitioned. So 
partitioned is going to operate on partition data, which just means you split the data in half um, based on some certain condition. For example, you have odds in the beginning of the vector and uh, evens at the end of the vector. You can partition your data like that and do some special operations on it. Sorting is everyone's favorite. Everyone knows what sorting is. You can do a few sorting tricks like right here. Binary search. So you want to do some stuff in log n time, impress some people, then you know you can do these algorithms on it. Sorted data operations. If your data is sorted, then you can do some more efficient operations than normal. So you can do some things like merge, includes, some set intersections, uh, differences, stuff like that. Heap is for heap data structures, which I'm not going to go over, but you know it exists. And then some min-max stuff, like find the minim minimum element at a range in a range, stuff like that, you can do that. Permutations is literally just permutations, like transforming things. Like you got this string, you want to transform it into the next permutation, you can do that with this. And that's it. Those are the one, I think they are 105. I read 105 somewhere. So those are the STL algorithms. You can use them yourself. And using them will make you a really good programmer. So the way you use this resource, with these final notes is, the auto keyword was purposely not used. So for example, let's look up here. Like, look at this monstrosity right here. Look at this line of code. You've got a pair of iterators named P, and that's going to equal this stuff. And this is like super huge and ugly to read. And to be honest with you, you should use the auto keyword right here. But I, for, for the examples, I didn't use that. But make sure you use the auto keywords in your own code. Remember, I just wrote this to be explicit so that you actually know what's going on here. But you don't. You might not need to know that in your code, so you can use auto if you want. It might make more sense for you. Another note is I use range a lot, even though I use vector begin dot end. But remember, you can use your range can be anywhere in the container. It doesn't have to be the beginning and the end of a vector. It could be you know somewhere in the middle or, or some weird combination. Be creative. Next, some algorithms also have overloaded versions to provide a custom comparator. For example, like let's say you have a sorting algorithm, but you're sorting a custom object. Like maybe you have some struct that has a first name for a person, a last name for a person, and a phone number for that person. But you want to do something like last name first alphabetically, then first name first alphabetically, then phone number alphabetically like that. You can make your own custom comparator sometimes to, you know, there, there are overloaded versions of these algorithms, but I didn't show them here. This is supposed to be simple. And the final note is pay careful attention to ordering. So for example, I'm telling you that passed in an iterated to the beginning and an iterated to the end. Uh, make sure you read this and actually make sure because some examples like nth element are not intuitive. So, so read is, is the keyword here. Now, if you see a problem, I wrote all these lines myself. If you see like there's some sort of spelling mistake or the example doesn't work or the code doesn't work, please contact me and let me know because you can even make a GitHub issue or pull request if you want and I'll try to fix it. There might be some mistakes, something is unclear, just do let me know. And there's a contact form on my website if you wanna contact me that way. On my website, there's also a bunch of social media links for example, I have Discord, I have YouTube, I've got Twitter, I've got Twitch, I've got GitHub. There are so many social media things. They'll also be below this video, so make sure you follow me on there, seriously. And subscribe if you want more C++ videos. And um, yeah, that's it. So so um, what you're going to do right now, I'm telling you what to finally do. You're going to come to this page. First, you're going to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Then you might follow me on social media. But come to this page. Just click the bookmark button and bookmark it and maybe hit a star here so that it helps me out and that other people know that this resource exists because I haven't found any other cool, like little code examples for this SQL algorithm. So that would help me and other developers out. So I'm Source Make. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you can input these into your own code and, you know, make your own code a little bit cooler and, you know, say, hey, I don't have to write my own for loops. I've got the C++ standard library people to write that code for me. I, I just write these short, simple, cool lines. So yeah, hopefully you can utilize this and thanks for watching.